Good morning and welcome to this worship service coming to you from Clevedon Family Church in North Somerset on this Lord's Day morning. If you're part of our church family or if you're a virtual visitor to us, you are very welcome this morning. And when the current restrictions are over and we're able to meet together in the church building, we hope that if you're in our area, you will come and join us so that we can meet you properly. Clevedon Family Church, uh, we're, it's not called Clevedon Family Church because we're just for families. It's because we are a family uh, brought together uh, by a shared faith, brought together by the Holy Spirit in Jesus Christ. If you would like to contact us before then, the details are on our website. We will be sharing in communion later in this service, although our church members have been told in advance so they can prepare. Uh, if you're a visitor, you might want to get uh, the necessary ready, the, a bit of bread and something, some form of drink ready if you want to participate with us. At Cleveland Family Church, we invite anyone who loves the Lord Jesus or who sincerely desires to know him to take the bread and the juice. This morning I have uh, just a couple of uh, birthday shout outs for the week ahead. Uh, we wish happy birthday this morning to Pauline and to Wendy and uh, to anyone else whose name I haven't been told. Uh, uh, so happy birthday to you. Now let's ask God's blessing on our time together. Father, we come and meet in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, we delight to do that because you are a good and loving God, you have been so good to us. We want to worship you. Lord, we want to meet with you, give you honour and praise. And we want to thank you for the ways that you have blessed our lives. So Lord, send the Spirit, we pray, and bless our time as we commit it into your hands in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, uh, in a, a moment, in after our song, we will uh, we will be um, having a children's song. Yeah, we will have the kids talk in a moment. But first, let's uh, worship together. We sing, "Water You Turned Into Wine." <laughs> Then I 
again. Hey, I wonder where you were born. Because we live in England, I expect most of you were born in England. But I wasn't. I was born in Holland. Holland's not a long way from England, just next door really. Here's where it is on a map of the world and uh, here's where we live too. But I've got friends who were born much further away than Holland. I'd like you to meet them. Uh, this is my friend Janka, and she's from Slovakia. Let's see where Slovakia is on the map. Hmm, it's a bit further away. Let's go further. Uh, this is my friend Matthew. Matthew was born in Ghana, though he lives in France now. Let's see where Ghana is. It's in Africa. Well, that's a long way away. But this is my friend Sukesh, and he was born even further away in India, although he lives right here in Clevedon now. Let's put where he was born on the map. There's India. It's a very long way away. And furthest of all, this is my friend Choi, who was born in Korea. Where's Korea? My goodness, it's on the other side of the world. Now, all these people are my friends, but they're more than my friends. They're my brothers and my sister. How can this be? It's because they are all followers of Jesus. In fact, I met all of them in different churches. Jesus said that we are his brothers and his sisters if we follow him. And if we've got Jesus as our brother, then we're all part of the same family, the family of God. So these friends are my brothers and sisters. And the Bible says something else very important about being part of the church. And you'll find it in, in the book of Galatians, chapter 3. And it says, there is no difference between Jewish people and people who aren't Jewish between slaves and free people, between men and women. You are all one in union with Christ Jesus. That means that in church, it doesn't matter where you were born or what the color of your skin is or whether you're rich or poor. We're all equal and we're all part of the same family because we all follow Jesus. Now we're going to sing a song now, it's a fun song. It's a song that was written about 100 years ago in America and it was first sung by black people who had a very hard life because they were black and, and we must say, that is wrong, isn't it? But they loved Jesus and they knew that, it would be, that they would be going to heaven one day, which would be much, much better. And uh, it's a fun song because they pictured the church as a train, a train which was on its way, on the tracks, on its way to heaven. And you can maybe hear the sound of an old steam train chuffing along in the rhythm of the song. So uh, here's the song and join in uh, if you can. hear that train rhythm. This train is bound for glory. This train is bound for glory. Hang the 
somebody right, but the righteous and the holy must train this pile for glory. train to glory to a wonderful place so here we go stay well stay happy god loves you and we'll see you all again very soon our bible reading this morning will be luke uh, chapter 10 verses 25 to 37 that is from the gospel of luke chapter 10 verses 25 to 37 before that, we're going to have a time of worship now, and uh, we're going to sing, we stand up and stand and lift up our hands, for the joy of the Lord is our strength. After that, uh, Luke, Zach, Maisie, and Callie will uh, help us to worship, help us to, to meditate on the goodness of God with a song called, You Say. Oh, 
today the reading will be from Luke 10:25 to 37. One day, an expert in religious law stood up to test Jesus by asking him this question. Teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus replied, what does the law of Moses say? How do you read it? The man answered, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind and all your strength and love your neighbour as yourself. Right, Jesus told him, do this and you will live. The man wanted to justify his actions, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbour? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. Uh, so too a Levi, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he travelled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring oil, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took up two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you have. Now, which of these three would you say was the neighbour? Um, Jesus asked the man. Um, the man replied, the one who showed him mercy. Then Jesus said, yes, now go and do the same. The story of the Good Samaritan is arguably the best known of all the stories or parables that Jesus told. The phrase Good Samaritan has come into the English language and is used today to refer to someone who comes to the aid of a person in need. But for Christians, this parable is also something of a puzzle. The puzzle isn't so much in the story Jesus tells, but in the reason he tells it. Jesus is asked a question. And he doesn't seem to answer it in the way we might expect him to. What's the question? Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? It's an interesting question because it contains two assumptions. First, the question assumes that there is such a thing as eternal life to be had, that there is more to life than this life that we now experience. Many people, even people of no faith, believe that. And secondly, the question assumes that eternal life isn't inevitable. It's not something that everyone automatically gets when they die. There are conditions to be met, things to be done, if a person is going to enjoy eternal life. I'm not so sure that is so widely believed in our society today. There seems to be a widespread belief that everyone will go somewhere nice when they die, maybe for some with the exception of those who we consider to be really bad people. Just as an aside now, uh, the, the Jews and we as Christians, when we talk about eternal life, we're not just meaning a, a life like this one, but longer. Uh, the eternal life that Jesus speaks about, for instance, in John 3.16, uh, isn't just saying that we're going to live forever. It says something about the quality of that life. The word eternal is important. There is no end to eternal life, but it is eternal life, not just eternal existence. This is life in all fullness, without frustrations, restrictions, deprivations. It's life lived in the full, unhindered presence of God and in the full experience of his love. That will go on forever, but will never be arduous or boring, will always be totally fulfilling. That's what Jesus' questioner meant by eternal life. So his question is a very important one, because assuming there is such a life to be had, if there are conditions to be met, as the question implies, things that we have to do, then it would seem very important to find out what the conditions are, what we have to do. So here's a man asking Jesus possibly the most important question there could be. What must I do to inherit eternal life? The problem for us evangelical Christians is that Jesus doesn't give the answer we might expect. We'd expect him to say something like, ah, it's not about doing, 
It's about believing. That's the way to inherit eternal life. Now, elsewhere, Jesus does say something like that. John uh, 6, 28, Jesus is asked, what must be, we do to do the works God requires? And he answers, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. But here he seems to be giving a different answer, not about believing, but about doing. So there's the puzzle. Is Jesus saying that we aren't saved by faith, but by what we do? Or is he maybe saying that there are two ways to be saved, either by faith or by being a good person? The way we tease out the true meaning of what Jesus was saying is by looking at the context of the original question. Because we're told at the outset that this man who comes to Jesus isn't a genuine seeker after truth. No, his motivation is to test Jesus, maybe to trap Jesus into saying something that he can use against him. After all, this was a teacher of the law, and generally they weren't favourable to Jesus. They had form for trying to find evidence against him. And it's the man's motivation which colours the way Jesus responds to him. If the man had been a seeker after truth, then maybe Jesus would have given him a straight answer, but he's not. And so Jesus responds to him in a different way. Psychologists call what Jesus does cognitive dissonance. Don't be afraid. It's a complicated word, but it's a simple concept. Cognitive dissonance means that it's when you know that you can't change a, mind, a person's mind by arguing with them, by direct uh, reasoning, because they're not open to that. You try and get them to see something that something is inconsistent in the way in what they believe. You'll all have been in the situation, I'm sure, if you're a Christian, no matter how logical and reasonable your arguments are, you get nowhere because the person you're talking to is not open to be persuaded. They have closed their minds. And in the technique of cognitive dissonance, you might possibly uh, point out how two things they are saying and that they believe contra contradict each other. Or you might uh, sort of take, cause them to take their own thinking to its logical conclusion, in the hope being that they'll see the contradiction or that they'll be uncomfortable where they, where, with where their own beliefs lead them. Then they might reevaluate their beliefs and become open to considering something different. This is what Jesus is doing when he meets the man's question, not with an answer, but with another question. This is an expert in the law. So Jesus meets him where he is and asks, what is written in the law? How do you read it? And the man replies with what had become recognized as the most important commandments of the law. First, love God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength. And secondly, love your neighbor as you love yourself. And Jesus says that is a great answer. Then, uh, like Nike, he says, just do it. Now, the man's probably feeling a bit foolish. He has tried to test Jesus, probably hoping to trap him into saying something he can use against him. But Jesus has dodged that one very easily. And maybe the man feels he's been shown up in public. But quickly, he thinks of another angle to test Jesus. Who is my neighbor? He asks. Because many of the Jews of Jesus' day had come to understand the term neighbor as only referring to their fellow Jews. So there was a teaching that said that the second great commandment, you know, love your neighbor, mean, meant love your fellow Jews and hate everyone else. Now the law never said that, but this is what Jesus is referring to in Matthew 5. When he talks about loving your enemies, he, he says, uh, you have heard it said that, you have heard it said, uh, you know, uh, lo love your Friends, <laughs> no, you have heard it said. Uh, he doesn't say, you have seen it written, because it wasn't written. It was what they had come to believe. So the trap is, is Jesus sound on the issue of Jewish identity, of Jewish specialness? And of course, Jesus isn't going to fall for that one either. And instead of answering, answering the question, he tells a story. The story of a man attacked on a lonely road, robbed and left for dead, of two individuals who passed by without stopping to help, 
and one man who does stop and who makes sure that the injured man gets everything he needs. And then he asks the question, who was the neighbor to the man? It is, of course, what the Americans call a no-brainer. And the scandal of the story is that the man who acted as a neighbor was a Samaritan, the person who Jesus' Jewish listeners would have looked down on because of his heritage. It's a beautiful, perfect story. And it does answer the question, doesn't it? Who is my neighbor? It answers it indirectly, but very clearly. The neighbor is anyone and everyone. Because Jesus doesn't say who the attacked man is. He's just described as a man. Or if you like the King James Version, a certain man. Either way, there's no ethnicity here, no class distinction, no identity at all. No relationship between the man needing help and the one who stopped to help, except for a shared humanity. So Jesus is saying that to obey the second commandment, the greatest commandment, means to love every person in the world and to express that love in practical ways. When any person is in need, the commandment says we must do what it takes to give them appropriate help. It's a very important principle. It's not a new thing that Jesus has come up with. It just restates something that we find again and again in the Old Testament, which is God's heart for those in need and his summons to his people to do something about it. Now, individual Christians and the church corporate, corporately have always had that understanding to some, one extent or another. Part of following Jesus is, is about giving practical help to those in need. I always remember, as a very vivid uh, picture to me, of the, the Labour politician Roy Hattersley when he went to New Orleans to observe the relief effort after Hurricane Katrina had swept through and devastated the city. And he wrote a piece for the Guardian newspaper when he came back because he was so struck by who it was that he saw doing the relief work. Now, Roy Hattersley is not a believer, not a Christian. But he'd noticed that almost all the people giving the practical aid doing the relief work were religious groups. And uh, most notably in the American context, it was the Salvation Army. So this is what he wrote. He wrote, the Salvation Army has been given a special status as provider-in-chief of American disaster relief. But its work is being augmented by all sorts of other groups. Almost all of them have a religious origin and character. Notable by their absence are teams from rationalist societies, free thinkers clubs and atheist associations, the sort of people who not only scoff at religion's intellectual absurdity, but also regard it as a positive force for evil. And he, want, he puzzled about how this could be. Why could it be? He wrote, it ought to be possible to live a Christian life without being a Christian. And yet he said, men and women who, like me, cannot accept the mysteries and the miracles, do not go out with the Salvation Army at night. And he ends this way. The only possible conclusion is that faith comes with a packet of moral imperatives. That while they do not condition the attitude of all believers, influence enough of them to make them morally superior to atheists like me. The truth, for him the truth is no God, the truth may make us free, but it has not made us as admirable as the average captain in the Salvation Army. Now, it would be wrong to claim that Christians and the church have a monopoly on giving practical care to people in need. But if I look at the situation I'm familiar with, with provision for the homeless in Bristol, a few years ago, uh, all the voluntary care was done by Christian groups or, or groups set up by Christians. And even today, a large proportion of it is you have the Crisis Centre Ministries, now called In Hope, the Julian Trust, the Methodist Centre, until recently the Sisters of Charity, uh, 125, the Salvation Army, and a host of, of other individual churches which are, are situated around the, the city centre. The atheist Roy Hattersley saw something he couldn't deny. And it was very big of him to admit it, but I dare to suggest that he has 
uh, missed the point a little. His, his conclusion was that religion comes with moral imperatives. In other words, re religion brings with it a set of rules that followers must obey. But the story of the Good Samaritan is more than a statement of moral imperative. I said that there was cognitive dissonance here, something that should make us uneasy if we think this is just a moral imperative, something we have to do. And the source of that unease is found in the nature of the commandments that Jesus affirms and in his simple statement, do this and you will live. Because have you ever tried to love your neighbour as yourself? Your neighbour being, according to Jesus, absolutely everyone without distinction. And have you tried to love them in the way that the Samaritan loved the person in need, i.e. putting himself out and providing for the man's needs out of his own possessions? I don't know about you, but I've realised that I fail to keep that commandment every single day. For example, if one of my children was to get a serious illness which required expensive treatment not available on the national health, I would empty my bank account. I would sell my house. I would sell everything I own to pay for it. I would do that for one of my nieces and nephews. I think I might do it for the child of a really close friend. But every day around the world, children die of conditions that could be treated if the money was available. And I give a little bit to charity, but I don't sell all my worldly possessions to help them. And the conclusion must be that I love my children a great deal, but I love other people's children a great deal less, or maybe not at all. And so I fail the commandment to love my neighbour as myself. And that's not even the greatest commandment. That is to love the Lord my God with all my heart and with all my soul and with all my strength and with all my mind. And I don't think I even need to, to expand that for it to be obvious that we, f we all fail in that too. In fact, failure is built into us. Since the fall described in Genesis 3, humankind has been obsessed with self. And so in my human nature, I am selfish, always tending to be more concerned with my own needs than those of others and with loving myself rather than God. That is the way I am. And the parable of the Good Samaritan puts us into a bind when we really look at what it's telling us to do and we realise we can't do it, which means that we can't meet the conditions of inheriting eternal life. If the last word on the subject is do this and you will live, then we will die because we can't do it. But that's not the last word. The gospel of Jesus Christ has wonderfully more to say. The gospel isn't do good and you can have eternal life. It's not even do your best and you can have eternal life. The conditions for entry to eternal life, as we've seen, are far tougher than that. But the solution is far more wonderful. In fact, the early church fathers saw the gospel hidden in this very story. They said that you and I are the certain man, injured and helpless through our own foolish choices and through the actions of others, including our first parents, Adam and Eve. And as we uh, lie absolutely unable to meet the conditions for eternal life, someone comes to where we are, looks on us with compassion and does for us what we need. And that person is Jesus, God's own son who comes from heaven to seek and to save the lost. And as the Samaritan did, to pay the cost for the treatment we need. On the cross, Jesus paid the price for our salvation. God accepted Jesus' perfect life and sacrificial death in, a, in exchange for our failure to meet his standard of perfect love. For God so loved the world 
that he gave his only son, that all who believe shall not perish, but have eternal life. Now, I love that song uh, we heard from Luke, uh, Zach, Maisie and Callie, when it says, uh, you know, you say I am loved when I can't feel a thing. You say I am strong when I think I am weak. You say I'm held when I am falling short. That's the truth of God spoken into our lives. But the song also takes the thought that we will never measure up. And says that that thought is a lie. And I know the context uh, that the song is alluding to. And in that context, it's right. That thought is a lie. But there is a profound sense in which the idea that we will never measure up is the truth. It is not possible for us to earn or deserve eternal life. However hard we try because we fail to meet God's entry requirements. But in his love for us, God sent his son who loved us and gave himself for us so that by believing in him, we could inherit eternal life. Strangely, the expert in the law uh, was right in his question. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Who knows, You you can't earn an inheritance. If an inheritance comes to you, you have to accept it as a gift. And that's how it is with eternal life. It's God's gift to all who accept his son as their saviour and make him Lord of their life. It's Romans 6.23, isn't it? For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Doesn't mean we can then live any way we like. Of course it doesn't. But part of God's gracious activity in us means that a genuine believer in Christ doesn't want to live any way they like. As an atheist, Roy Hattersley didn't understand the dynamic of the Christian faith and life. He put what he saw Christians doing down to the, the rules and the collective norms that come with joining a religion. But the Apostle Paul suggests a very different dynamic. He says we don't do these things because we're following the rules of our religion, but because the love of Christ compels us. 2 Corinthians 5. It's like when you understand how much God has loved you, so much that he sent his son to die on a cross in your place, then you want to love him in return. And when Jesus, by the Holy Spirit, is at work in you, your capacity to love is is increased and you find your attitude to those in need is changed. You have a new compassion. You want to live more generously towards others. We are changed, but not by having rules imposed on us. We are changed from the inside. So to sum up, you can't meet the conditions of God's law. But you can inherit eternal life by receiving Jesus Christ as Saviour and Lord. Do you need to do that today? To believe in Jesus Christ, to receive him as your Saviour and give your life to him. To trust in his death and resurrection alone to make you right with God. You can. And if you do, you will find that he is the way and the truth And the life, he is all you need in order to inherit eternal life. And if you already did that, maybe you did that years ago. Thank God for what you have received in Christ. For the love which came looking for you when you were helpless in your sin. Without God and without hope in the world. The love that did what was needed so that you could be saved and inherit eternal life. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we uh, thank you for your word, which is truth. Ask that you would uh, imprint the truth of your word in our hearts, in our minds, Lord, so that we could live in in the good of them, so that we could love you more, so that we could love our neighbors more. Lord, uh, we praise you for what you've done for us in Christ. And we thank you from the bottom of our hearts. 
Amen. After we uh, sing together, Mervyn will lead us in communion. But now let's, uh, let's worship the Lord. Let's give thanks to the Lord as we sing together. Jesus Christ, I look upon your sacrifice. It was nearly two weeks ago that I had the shocking news from my niece that a relative of hers in Scotland was cycling in the country outside Glasgow and he was set upon by ten young men who hurled bricks at him. When he was on the ground they attacked him, stabbed him three times, totally unprovoked and his dad Jerry had to go up to Glasgow and visited him and my first emotion was anger and I just felt for his father what had been a normal day through one telephone call became a nightmare and forgiveness was not the first thing that came to mind but after a moment's thought I considered how God the Father and his son Jesus forgives us. 
forgives us for his son taking all our sin on the cross. Paul, he reminds the church, you are the body of Christ and members individually. We grasp this truth when we partake of the bread and the wine. Jesus is the head of the body and he empowers us to be like him so that we too can be Christ-like. John wrote, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We can have forgiveness for everything that we have done. But not only that, we can have an inner heart cleansing from what we are. He can change us inside. And the bread and the wine help us to focus on his broken body and his shed blood, on his forgiveness and his love. He is our saviour and our Lord. And we need him to work his grace within our hearts. Shall we pray? Dear Lord, we thank you that by your sacrificial death on the cross, you have done everything necessary to bring each one of us into fellowship with you. As we partake of these emblems of your broken body and shed blood, or as some just bow in contemplative prayer and meditation, we ask your forgiveness for all our sins and failures and an empowerment by your Holy Spirit to serve you in newness of life. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we, though many, are one bread and one body, for we all partake of that one bread. Dear Lord, as we take this bread and wine, wherever we are, renew our hearts and let us know your peace. Amen. Jesus broke the bread and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Guide our thoughts, O Lord, in these moments of contemplation. In the same manner, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Dear Lord, thank you for your presence among us and by your spirit within us enable us to share your forgiveness in a suffering world. Amen. Let's join together in prayer now. Father, we pray uh, for the world in which we live, 
a beautiful world that you created, but a world of need. We pray once again for the uh, ongoing COVID pandemic situation. Lord, thank you that in, in our nation, it seems to be uh, on the decline. Pray that you continue to, to cause that to happen. Pray for those nations where it is still a, a huge problem. Pray for those uh, who are sick at the moment with it and those who are on the front line asking for your healing and your protection. Pray for our government making decisions, Lord, and for the scientists who are working to try and find a cure or a vaccine. And Father, we, we pray also for uh, peace and justice in the world, remembering the, the death of George Floyd and all the, the anger and hurt that has been uh, come to the surface. Let's pray for uh, racial harmony in the world and, and for justice for all peoples, for your kingdom to come. And we pray for your church throughout the world, uh, particularly churches uh, operating in difficult circumstances, revealing the love of Christ in, in places of need. We ask your blessing and your provision on those uh, Christians and those churches. And we pray for those who we know, who are in particular need of your touch today, of your healing, of your peace, of your provision. We remember them before you now. And we thank you that you are a God who hears and a God who answers prayer. And we join together in the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. We're going to sing uh, one more time this morning, a great old hymn of the faith. We're going to sing, uh, How Great Thou Art.
And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard our hearts and our minds in the knowledge and the love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be upon you now and remain with you always. Amen.